Hi, Steve here at blessedhopeforever.com. Halloween is tomorrow. If uh, you look at October the 31st of this year as the date of the rapture, let's just assume that we're going to be raptured on Halloween. and you add 1290 days, you come to the midpoint, May 14, 2028, in which Israel would be exactly 80 years old. Now, uh, how do we know it's 1290 days from the rapture to the midpoint? As I've explained in many a video, we know because we're given numbers uh, 1260 days, the two witnesses witness after the first half of the tribulation period, 1260. And then the Antichrist rules for 42 months or 1260 days. That's the great tribulation period, the second half of the tribulation. And that, that adds up to 2550 days. It would be 2520 days if it was 1260, 1260, but it's 2550 days because it's 1290, 1260. How do we know it's 1290? Because that would leave a 30, that would place a 30 day gap between the rapture and the beginning of the tribulation. I've always suggested the rapture would occur whenever it occurs. We're looking at a 30-day gap, which would begin the 1260 days of the, of the two witnesses witnessing, and, and then the second half being 1260 days. So that'd be 2550 days. I hope that's not too confusing. Uh, the reason for that is there are a number of reasons uh, for the 1290, just as there are uh, reasons for the midpoint to the kingdom uh, to be 1335 days. Uh, I would have to refer you back to previous videos to explain the, the correct number of days along a timeline, but it, uh, it all adds up to 2625 days from rapture to kingdom, 2625 days. But Going back to Halloween tomorrow, that's uh, as the as the the day of, date of this uh, video uh, being published. This is October thirtieth. Uh, once again, if if you look at October thirty first as the date of the rapture, and you add twelve hundred ninety days to that, you come to May 14, twenty twenty eight, which in which Israel would be exactly eighty years old. Uh, that reminds us of Psalm 90, verse 10. Uh, and the fact that a generation is 80 years old and they fly away. Uh, uh, the three and a half years of, of the Great Tribulation. Uh, uh, this is uh, Psalms, Psalm 90, verse 10. Uh, the fly away. They, they would, the writer of Psalms would not have known anything about the rapture. Uh, we're looking at that as uh, at least there's a great possibility that that is referring, the flying away is referring to God removing his people to safety during that period. So that's what we're looking at as far as Halloween is concerned. Now on our timeline, the one that we, our most recent timeline, which in which the big day is November 29 uh, this year, uh, I'd have to refer you back to previous videos on the last update we did on that. that. That is a very significant date in prophetic history. Uh, November 29, 1947, this was the day that the United Nations voted on Resolution 181, the partition of Palestine, which led to the creation of the modern state of Israel. If we, uh, if we look at that, uh, that date and we we come to November 29 this year, that's exactly 77 years. So we find that interesting. Uh, even more so when we look at the fact that 
November 29 this year, if we add 12, if we go forward 1290 days to a midpoint, it would land on June 10, 2028. And if we go to the creation cal calendar, June 10 uh, is the date that Adam was created, June 10, 3977. I also find it strangely odd that uh, given the fact that there's 26, 25 days along any timeline raptured to the kingdom, if you go raptured to the kingdom, not raptured to the second coming, rapture to the kingdom, that's 26, 25 days total. Uh, well, from the Revelation 12 sign that occurred September 23rd, 2017, if you go 26, 25 days, you actually come to November 29 this year, the rapture date on our timeline. Now, I also thought that you might find this interesting. I did. I, I created this chart to try to simplify it. I wanted to, to, to look at how many years Israel has been at war since the creation of the modern state of Israel. So we're looking at Israel war years as, as compared to years in which there was no war. And you'll notice from the chart here that I'm going to show you here, uh, uh, it, it appears at least to me that there were six years of peace allowing Israel to gain a foothold. Um, uh, the, uh, at the beginning of Israel becoming a state, there, there were a war broke out immediately uh, from 47 to 49, but then you have a, a period of relative peace in which I believe God was allowing Israel to gain a foothold. Uh, what's also interesting in this is if you look at the, the years in which there was war, they were at war, uh, I can't help but see a couple of uh, facts that, that seem to dominate that period or explain, you could say explain that period, and that is the modern uh, state of Iran, the Ayatollah Khomeini, the, uh, just the war years of Iran and the, and the Ayatollah Khomeini, uh, when uh, the Shah of Iran was, uh, was, was removed and the, and the Ayatollah uh, Khomeini, Khomeini uh, gained control of the country. You're also able to see in this chart the war years uh, of the administrations of Obama, Trump, and Biden. Uh, I find it very interesting that, that just look at the Trump years and you'll see something, hopefully you'll see something very interesting there. Uh, I do not believe that, I, I tried to simplify the chart, make it, you know, color code it. So the, the blue, you know, is, uh, and the red uh, separates war and whether it's war or no war, I don't think we're, we're, we're likely not to see any more blue in this kind of chart, given the, the days that we're living, the, 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 the times that were, the prophetic t times that we're, that it's playing out. But what's really interesting about this to me is that, one of the things anyway, is that they've been at war 50 out of 76 years, if you, if you count those years now, my source for all this information was Wikipedia, where that they listed the years in which Israel had conflict or they were at war. So when I added it all up, it's 50 out of 76 years they were, were at war. And the uh, as many of you know, the number 50 drives its meaning primarily from its relationship to the coming of God's Holy Spirit. Uh, of course, and many of you are aware of the fact of how 50 symbolizes deliverance or freedom from a burden. Uh, God commanded ancient Israel that every 50th year on the Day of Atonement that a jubilee was to be declared with the sound of a trumpet. Uh, and so that's our prophetic update for this particular time as we move ahead forward into the election uh, here in the U.S. and the uh, 
the kind of the wrapping up of the year 2024. None of us really know what's going to happen, but there are so many things to look at that it's, it does keep a person kind of busy. Now, what I want to talk about here, if, if you're not into doctrine and if you're just looking for the Lord to return and you're not all that really concerned about what I believe is of, should be of great concern, and that is how we are to live our lives as Christians, how, how we are to walk uh, as Christians, uh, our conduct, our behavior within the body of Christ. If you're not interested in any of that, uh, then you might want to just click off the video uh, because I'm going to talk about some things that uh, sort of, I guess as we come to the end of this year, I want to, I want to remind you of just how that we are uh, said to our bodies, and this is something that fascinates me greatly, uh, when, when we look at the physical aspect of our bodies, um, uh, in which we have a spiritual relationship uh, with the Lord, it's uh, what I find most interesting is, is that every action of the human spirit as we see it in which I'm I'm going to show you here in just a moment all of the actions that I'm about to describe is reflected in the actions of the human body God actually chose to use words that pertain to the action of, or or not always necessarily the action but the the, just the condition of, of the body, the human body, uh, the spiritual body of Christ. I, I'm probably not doing a very good job of explaining this, but every action that, that I'm about to show you is reflected in the actions of the human body. God simply used the human body and the various functions of the human body to describe what uh, is most crucially important as far as our day-to-day -day relationship with the Lord is concerned, I'll, uh, maybe it'll get clearer as I as I go about to explain this. Um, I've done video. Uh, I, I think I have done a video on this before. Uh, we're going to start with just the words. Uh, well, let me let me start with the fact that, that as many of you know and many of you don't know, we've actually died to the law. Galatians 2.19, For I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. Unless we're dead to the law, we cannot live unto God because, well, I, I, there's not one single reason. There's multiple reasons why that we cannot live unto God according to the flesh or, or law. But when the whole reality of it is by grace, but I just need to point out from the beginning here, right at, from the outset, that we are dead to the law. We died to the law. Uh, one of the reasons is, is clearly stated in 1 Timothy 1.9, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. Uh, well, Steve, I don't feel very righteous. I don't think I'm righteous. Well, God says you are. If you're a believer in Christ, He's made you righteous. 2 Corinthians 5.21, For He hath made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. We stand before Him holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. So, now based upon that, there are different body movements that we all uh, experience, uh, typically experience on a human level. Uh, sit, walk, stand, run, uh, rest, uh, you know, these things have always fascinated me because God chose those, those, those uh, I guess you'd call idioms, to describe our relationship with Him. Let's start with the first one. That, that would be sit. Not, these, these don't go in any necessary, they're not necessarily in any uh, certain order, but let's just start with sitting because we're going to stand after that. So we'll start with sitting. We are to sit. You and I are to sit. 
Uh, Ephesians 2, 6. I'm reading, and hath raised us up together. We were raised with Christ. When Christ raised, we were raised with Him. And made to sit. God made us sit. It's not something that we have to do. This describes a condition or a, or a, a position, you might say, of us in the body of Christ. Made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Right now, if you're a Christian, God, you can be assured that God made you by raising you with, him, with Christ, made you sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Sit together with Him. All right. So what does that mean? All right. So, okay, Steve, so what? I mean, you know, I'm, I'm raised up to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? You know, to be co-seated with Christ in the heavenlies. Well, it's important, I think, that we understand why Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. But let me go on with the word stand. Now we're to stand, Ephesians 6, 13 and 14. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins, loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. I just got through reading where that we were, have been made the righteousness of God in Christ. That's our breastplate. Uh, our loins girt about with truth. That is the Word of God. Uh, there's only one truth, one source of truth. It's not this pulpit. It's not anything else but the Word of God. That we henceforth be no more children, Ephesians 4.14, 4, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. We stand. We're not tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Uh, we are to stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. That's what we're studying uh, on Sunday in Galatians. Now we come to walk. We, we've gone from sit, stand, now we're at walk. Many verses that pertain to walk, uh, it's easy to see where we're at concerning that. Ephesians 4.1, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you were called. If we're walking in a way that is not consistent with the truth of the Word of God, we're not walking worthy of the vocation wherewith we were called. Galatians 5.15, this I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Okay, Galatians 5.25, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. The, the word is contrasting a fleshly walk, that's law, with a walk in the Spirit, which is one of grace. Not hard to understand. So, so we've looked at sit, we've looked at stand, we've looked at walk, and now we can look at run. And I, this, is why, this is why I find this so interesting. God used these terms to describe, you know, physical terms to describe something much greater, and that's the, the spiritual reality of our life in Christ. So we're to run, Galatians 5, 7. This is also something we're studying on Sunday. The text reads, ye did run well. You, the word well is beautiful. You ran beautifully. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? And, of course, the whole context is law versus grace, legalism, which crept into the church early and has remained to this day. Uh, this is how we are to, to run. We're to run in a beautiful way. We're not to run in a way which is not pleasing to God, which is law-keeping as a rule of life, or that our entire relationship with God is based on a system of human performance or human merit. Uh, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin. Now, this is very important, folks. If, you, if you've missed this in the passage, you need to pay attention. 
the sin, that is singular, not the sins, but the sin which doth so easily beset us. And that's the sin nature, the old man, the flesh, that is what is so easily, that is what so easily besets us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Uh, the, our, concentr our focus on the flesh and, and human performance and, and, and all of that, our, our, our attitude toward law keeping uh, uh, as a rule of life is, is a hindrance to our running with patience the race that's set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And now we come to rest. Now you could say, well, Steve, what? I, I can hear someone say, well, Steve, what's the difference between sitting and resting? Seems like the same thing. Uh, I don't, wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, I, I, don't, I don't see it as the same thing, but you know, it, it sounds the same, but it's really not. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. I want to read the entire 11 verses. Uh, this has to do with our resting in Christ. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left of us of entering into His rest, any, any of you should seem to come short of it. I um, have no doubt the Holy Spirit, uh, God the Holy Spirit knew uh, when He wrote this that there would continually be many of us who would not enter into His rest. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. We're looking at Christ's finished work. This is why we rest, because there's nothing left to add or do Nothing left to add to what he did. Uh, he's the author and the finish, finisher of our faith. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. He, you know, that's easy to understand. Six days work, one day rest, Sabbath rest. Seeing therefore it remains that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached enter not in because of unbelief. Again, he, he limits a certain day, saying, And David, today, after so long a time, uh, as it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? There therefore, uh, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works. Ceased from his own works. You know, it's, it's one of the things I've found most difficult to teach over the years is, is to other Christians is that we, because the general attitude among most Christians is that we're to work. And of course we do, but it's not the flesh that works. Uh, we are to enter into His rest. We have ceased from our own works. God doesn't recognize our works as being any, anything comparable to what Christ did, His work on our behalf. So let us labor, therefore. There's a work. All right, here's... Here, I also have found it interesting how that the Holy Spirit uses the word labor. That's an, a very intense word, labor. Uh, it, is, it is a labor. It is very difficult. It's work. It's, it, believe me, it is work. It's very difficult to, to labor, to be involved in that labor, which Hebrews is describing. It, it is very much a labor to enter into that rest. Why? Because we don't tend to want to we don't find it all that easy to do. It's, it's easy. It's not work to not enter into His rest. It's really labor to enter into His rest. And He's telling us that it is. Labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. So we've got, we've got sit. Uh, we've got stand. We've got walk. Uh, we've got run. 
and we've got rest. And these are all things that we, it's almost, you would almost have to say that, or you would almost have to think that God the Holy Spirit used these terms just so that we wouldn't, there would be no possibility of us misunderstanding what he was saying because everyone knows what it means to sit, stand, walk, run, and rest. Now, when we come to what's, what's moreover, I mean, if we, if we go beyond uh, the, just the, the, the standard uh, sit, stand, walk, run, rest is to describe our relationship with Him, it becomes much more interesting because when we look at the word obey, it doesn't mean do like most people think. It means to hear. It's the, it's the obey is the intensified form of the word hear in the Greek. If you don't believe me, just look at the word faith. Faith comes through hearing and hearing through the Word of God. The word, the word hear, hearing, faith comes through hearing, is a kuo in the Greek. Obey is hupakuo. It's the intense form of that. So really what obey means is means that you really hear. It's the intensified form of, of hearing. Now whether we're talking about obey, obedient, obedience, all the derivatives of the word obey. There's roughly 66 in the New Testament. All of these derivatives do not mean to do, but they mean to hear. That's something that Christians really need to understand because the word obey is used in the sense of the word do, which is very misleading. Uh, that, that actually puts the flesh at work there. And that. So, and now when we come, the same with the word keep. You know, if we keep His commandments, well, Steve, we got to keep His commandments. The word keep is guard, uh, just like a, it's used in the context of a prison guard. The word tereo in the Greek, keep, is guard. We do guard His commandments, and it's a first-class condition. It's not if we keep or if we guard, it's since we guard because it's a first-class condition in the Greek. The text is saying that you as a Christian guard His commandments. Now, that doesn't mean that you're under law. There are commandments given us concerning not being under law. And so we guard His commandments. Now, now I'm, I'm, this, this is what kind of surprised me in my early years as a Christian. After going through all of this with people, uh, they, would, they would feel the necessity to hit me with, you know, because they're looking for some reason to justify actions of the flesh or the value of the flesh, the worthiness of the flesh, the, the idea that we are in some sense under law, that we have to work, that we have to gain merit with God somehow, that, that well, Steve, what about the word do? Okay, you, you cannot, there's so many uh, usages of the word do in Scripture. You can't, how are you, how you going to explain away the fact that, that we are to do? Because Scripture uses the word do. And that's the word is poio. Okay? And uh, how, I, my question back to them usually is something like, well, how would we, if God did not use the word do, how would He even get the point across? I mean, how would He... How would you describe the actions of an individual if you didn't use the word do? Just because the word do is used doesn't mean that we're under law, if you, if you get my drift. It doesn't mean that we are under law as a, a principle of life, just because we have do all throughout Scripture. The, the question is not that we do. We do do. It's just, the question is how do we do? And that's where the, the crux of the matter lies. How do we do? Uh, how do we do? There's other things we do. You know, there's a lot of, I guess, what you'd call action verbs and even nouns that describe our position in Christ, uh, such as, uh, well, drink and eat. Uh, we, we eat of His flesh. We drink of His blood. We, we feast upon Christ. The, uh, uh, he is our source of nourishment, our source of life. So there's things, other things the body does, uh, just as our physical body eats and drinks to sustain life. So in the same sense, in the spiritual sense, we're to eat and drink of Christ. 
This is what the Jews didn't understand when Jesus said, if you don't uh, eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you have no part with me. Uh, it's uh, the metaphor that he was using to describe this was, was, was certainly, and, and this is what kind of puzzles me is because these Jews weren't stupid. And I'm sure that they knew that Jesus was speaking metaphorically, but they, when you read the text, it seems to, they seem to, you, you sort of get the picture that they didn't understand that at all. They, they were confused as to why that he would ask them to, to, to gnaw on him, you know, eat of his flesh and drink his blood. And, it, and many of them were offended by that. They just, and they thought maybe he was crazy for saying that. Uh, they strove among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat, they asked. And then Jesus said unto them, Truly, truly, I say unto you, except you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Okay? Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood has eternal life not will have, it's not a conditional thing, and I will raise him up the last day. Okay. And of course, there's other things like speak. Uh, the human body speaks. Uh, you know, uh, we're to speak the truth in love, to grow up into him in all things, which is ahead, Christ. Uh, uh, we also sleep. The human body sleeps. Now, this is a negative. This is one of the things we're told not to do is to sleep. Let us not sleep as do others. And so we know kind of what that means. It's all based on faith, folks. Our relationship, all of the sit, stand, walk, run, rest, all of this stuff, it's, it's, it's describing a relationship in which we are found in Him as... As Paul wrote to, uh, in the, I believe to the Philippians, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. I've said this so many times, folks. There is, there is, I, just to put it quite bluntly, all righteousness is of the Lord. We have none. If uh, you stand before Him holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight because He imputed that righteousness to you. Now, as far as your walk is concerned, uh, as far as your ongoing relationship with Him is concerned, uh, the same truth, the same exact, same truth applies. Okay? We are not under law. We are under grace. The new man has been made righteous and cannot cannot in and of itself the flesh profits nothing so the new the, the new man doesn't need the law because it's perfectly righteous and this is why we are to live and walk by faith it is the righteousness which is of god by faith it is not i but christ just as galatians says in, in chapter 2 uh, verses 19 through 21 for i through the law am dead to the law that i might live unto god i'm crucified with christ nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Okay? And if that isn't enough, folks, we have the works of the flesh in Galatians, which is contrasted with the fruit of the Spirit. Notice it's works of the flesh, it's never called fruit of the flesh. It's works of the flesh. And that's contrasted with the fruit of the Spirit, which in which you'll never read works of the Spirit. It's not works of the Spirit. It's fruit of the Spirit. It would make no sense to say fruit of the flesh and works of the Spirit. It is works of the flesh and fruit of the Spirit because it's contrasting ourselves with God. Uh, we know what the fruit of the Spirit is. And they that, it, that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. So if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. And now we can go a step further and we can see that there is 
Uh, in 2 Corinthians 4.10, there's another dynamic taking place, which is kind of fits right into the Galatians 2, 19 and 20. Not I, but Christ. It's Christ manifest. It's not I, but Christ in Galatians. In 2 Corinthians 4.10, it's Christ manifest. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Did you know that Jesus Christ can manifest His very life through you toward another? So every action of the human spirit is reflected in the actions of the human body. And I find that very interesting. I hope and I pray that you all are resting in Him, that you're looking unto Him, the author and the finisher of your faith, that you realize you stand, you do in fact stand before Him, wholly unblameable and unreprovable in His sight, that there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8.1, that God has nothing against you, that He has directed your paths, directed your steps, He knows the paths that you take, and He says that when you have been tested, you shall come forth as gold. He's dealt with the, the sin issue in its entirety. There's no longer any guilt or conscience of sin as a believer in Christ. He wants you. God wants you, folks, dearly beloved. God wants you to understand His undying love for you and just what He's accomplished for you, what He accomplished for you at Calvary when He died for your sins and He placed your sins as far as the east is from the west, buried them in the depths of the sea to be remembered no more. Uh, we are living at a time which is a little different than, I mean, certainly times have changed. But there's one thing that has not changed since the beginning of when, when Christ first arrived on the scene, somewhere around, somewhere between 30 and 32 AD. There's one thing that hasn't changed. With all the changes of, of throughout all of history, and there's one thing that has not changed. We see it clearly as we study through His Word, His marvelous Word. It stands out larger than ever that the one thing that has never changed is the idea of a system, a legalistic system based on human merit. It was the problem that it surfaced early in the Christian church. It has remained to this day and millions upon millions upon millions of Christians throughout that time, the time since then, millions have been bamboozled into believing that that we, our relationship with God is based upon human performance. It is not. It's been the, uh, my greatest desire and my, it's been my, my greatest prayer ever since I began this ministry that this ministry would reach out and touch the lives of those hurting Christians, despondent Christians who have suffered so greatly because of all of the garbage, all the, the law that's been heaped upon them Burdens that God never intended that they bear. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.